So, um, before we start this, I want to give you a bit of a background uh, just to let you know where I come from on the topic of moral realism. Well, like most people, I grew up reading the new atheists, you know, Sam Harris, Tenet, Hitchens, Dawkins. So I was mm -hmm. initially convinced that uh, moral realism is in fact a fair and rational argument, uh, primarily based on the moral landscape of Harris. But as I have grown older, I've just uh, moved more towards the sort of uh, constructivist phase, you know, so now mm -hmm. that is where I stand, though I haven't decided whether I'm a deontologist or consequentialist, but I'm pretty sure I'm a constructivist. So, but before we go into uh, deep into what the issues concerning moral realism, I think first we need to define what moral realism is and you're the perfect person to do so. So go ahead. Sure. And I mean, I'm not an innovator in any way here on this front. I'm cribbing directly from Schaefer Landau's moral realism and defense, um, where I think he correctly defines the position that we should be focused on as a kind of belief independent. So by objectivity, we mean something is independent of anybody's beliefs about that particular claim, anyone real or imagined. Um, so just to sort of give an example, right? It's wrong to enslave people, everybody, even if everyone in the cosmos, including God, believed that it was right to enslave people, that would not make it right on this view. So I think that's what we're arguing for here. I think that's a uh, fair definition, though I don't know the specifics, uh, specifics of where you stand or whether you would mm -hmm. be with uh, Harris or not, we'll discuss that. But um, first I need to put forth, I think, uh, Hume, because uh, that would be the first objection, uh, Hume's skeleton, which is that you cannot derive an um, is, uh, you cannot derive a not mm -hmm. from an is, right? Mm -hmm. So to put it in a sort of, uh, syllogistic manner, I think, would be that uh, the argument that most people put forward is, uh, let's say, proposition one is, I need to, I want to help that person in need. And the second proposition would be something like, if I don't help that person who uh, in need now, then the person will die. Therefore, mm -hmm. I ought to help that person in need. So it, it looks like a sort of logical argument in uh, at first glance, but if you peel back through, you will find that every proposition sort of has uh, an ought implicit in it, even though it is not uh, in the proposition itself. Let's say something like, why ought I help that person? Right. So I think mm -hmm. that when you make such, uh, this kind of argument, you will uh, only be, you know, in a process of infinite regress. That is, there will be an else and then a not and not and not. So things like that. So what would be your response to this? Yeah, so there's a lot here. This is obviously the is ought divide, the fact value divide. These are sort of core pushbacks that convinced a lot of people that moral realism was false and led to a long period in meta-ethics where, you know, versions of anti-realism and constructivism were the only game in town, though I think that has shifted back some in the present day. Now, for Hume in particular, this is in reference to his very famous um, is ought divide paragraph, essentially, it's like a paragraph long and heavily, heavily yeah. referenced, right? Um, now, first of all, I think we need to be really careful about interpreting that paragraph. There's a lot of debate around what Hume is actually cautioning us about in that paragraph. I think one plausible interpretation, and I'll, I'll, I'll sort of build my case for Humean moral realism, essentially. One plausible interpretation of what that paragraph is about is what he's saying is 
oftentimes people have impl- all, you know always if not often people have implicit moral premises or evaluative premises right that they're not making explicit um and and often they're doing that be, either they don't know that they're doing it or they're doing it because they don't want to have to defend the implicit moral claim that is involved in their view um that uh is then taken by some people to mean and it's impossible to ground the evaluative side of our arguments that you are stuck with some sort of regress or you can't point to anything in reality that would ground it because only is things exist in reality so there are no oughts out there or evaluative judgments out there i sort of reject that at a metaphysical level i think that um you know there are features of the universe that are evaluatively thick and that they instill in us moral obligations by their very existence and i think there's a reading of hume that can defend that position which is that hume at various points and again like hume is not 100 consistent no philosopher is i think but at some points he makes very realist sounding noises when he says you know, you have a, a moral sense and that moral sense can be trained and it's not just being trained to track your desires or to track what your society wants. It's actually being trained to track what is worthy of desire. He thinks that so, there are some points at which he seems to suggest some things are worthy of favor more than others. And I think the most plausible interpretation of that is because they have this kind of objective value that I want to defend. Um, so I think there is that kind of realist approach to Hume. Um, but even if there wasn't, I think the, the pushback, main pushback is, you know, the universe contains both um, facts and values, that it is there are value laden parts of the world. Um, and so we are not forced into an anti-realist position from the start merely by being unable to ground our premises in in evaluative facts mm. well i don't think i would agree with that uh, description of hume because i think that you are creating a false binary and correct me if i'm wrong you're creating a sort of false binary here between say moral realism and moral relativism you, you're saying that because uh do anti-realists or moral constructivists do not believe in moral realism they are somehow they somehow believe or ascribe to moral uh moral mm -hmm. realism they somehow ascribe to moral realism is that what you're saying no. because no not at all because, i haven't even said anything about what they are because obligated in that, towards yeah. In that case, I would say that uh, when Hume says that there's such a thing as, uh, you know, moral sense, he can be talking about sort of innate moral sense, as it were, you know, you can make an evolutionary argument for that, you know, that says nothing about whether you can derive a not from an is, which is an entirely separate debate. Right. So what I'm saying is, I agree with Hume that you can't derive an ought from an is, but I, I reject the metaphysical conclusion that some people reach that there are only is claims to be made around, about the world, that ought claims or evaluative claims are not truth functional claims about the world. I think they are, and I think they are grounded in things like the existence of your and my consciousness and the other and other sorts of value laden features of reality. Um, so I, I'm not at all ascribing to anti-realist some necessarily morally relativist view at this point i do think they face a challenge of resisting moral relativism that i'm not convinced that they can fully meet um but i don't think that i haven't said that that's the necessary reason that they're wrong i think generally i think they're wrong because I think moral claims are objective in exactly the way that I'm describing. Um, and so like they're just they're just wrong on the nature of moral truths, um, as well as that wrongness makes them susceptible to certain risks about things like relativism or nihilism. All right. So I think we need to define terms over here because I don't really know what you mean by truth sounding claims because you disagree because you agree with him that you cannot derive a not from an is then what exactly okay. uh huh yeah so if i say um you know all things being equal 
one ought not to cause unnecessary suffering. Okay, this is what I think of as a kind of foundational moral claim. Uh, and to me, I think that claim is a claim that can be true or false. I think it's true. I think we can know that it's true based on understanding the meaning of the concepts involved, some of which are things like suffering, which is a value laden description of a state that I think is fundamentally itself value laden, which is a state that you or I could be in and have probably been in at some point in our lives, right, where we were suffering greatly, and that was bad. And it has, you know, to use Mackey's own words against him, right, I would say it has to be avoidedness built into it. Um, and that to be avoidedness that is built into the suffering, which is part of our consciousness, which is part of the universe, provides what I would what, what I think people will call an evaluative fact right which is a thing that um is a statement about the world that can be true or false and in this case right if you're actually suffering it's true and that claim can then ground further ought claims about what we ought to do with regard to your suffering so that's the the framework that i would put forward um to and, and like that's what i mean when i say that these claims are are truth um, a valuable is that they are evaluated on the basis of things like the nature of your consciousness and suffering. Mm. Well, let me uh, summarize that. So we mm -hmm. know that we agree on where we disagree. So uh, I think the claims that you're making is essentially uh, proposition one is uh, this condi condition X would make the world a better place. Proposition two is uh, science can tell us uh, how to make the world a better place. Therefore, uh, we ought to do what science tells us to do. Is that a fair summary of what you're saying? Not exactly, because science, so science can help us get better on the empirical side of our moral reasoning. I don't think that science can tell us whether we should value fairness or liberty more for example i think those sorts of moral judgments have to be made by us based on argument and reason and intuition and all of these things and that often is a lifelong process of balancing these competing fundamental moral truths um science is useful when it comes to things like figuring out which produces more suffering spanking your children or not spanking your children right and like the evidence comes back and says not spanking your children produces you know less suffering and then we adopt our behavior uh because we have already correctly morally assessed that the suffering of children matters and we shouldn't cause unnecessary suffering to children hmm. well implicit in that is there's an axiom that we ought not to spank children well, there's no implicit, not implicit, but explicit at this yeah, point. Very yeah. explicit is the claim one ought not to cause unnecessary, all things being equal, right? Pro tanto, one ought not to cause unnecessary suffering. That is a foundational moral truth as far as I'm concerned, which is to say, I can help you unpack it further, but no further explanation, there's like no further fact of the matter or claim that is going to be needed to necessarily justify that claim. If you don't, um, you know, I think at best there are going to be people who just don't understand the claim sufficiently to acquiesce to it. But I think it is fundamental in the sense that there's only so much that you can do to unpack it further for people. Right. I can talk about words like unnecessary. I can talk about what we mean by suffering here. But if you understand all of the words in the sentence, but still believe that the sentence is false, I think you're, I, I don't know what else to be done there, but I don't think it's any disproof of the objectivity of that claim. I think it's a failure on the part of the person failing to understand at that point that it is an objective truth about the world. Well, if you say that it's a foundational moral truth and uh, how are you defining truth here? Are you defining truth in this sort of scientific sense? Are you defining, what is your definition? I mean, I'm I'm very much not an epistemologist, so I'm I'm using this in a fairly um, unformalized sense of it is a true claim. It is a claim about the world, right, or a claim about reality or the way things actually are, rather than how they might appear to us if in some sort of illusory kind of state. Um, you know, I'm not sure how how much it is worth going deep into the epistemology 
side of things. Um, I think, again, I think true here it just it means, yeah, that it's that it's a statement about reality. And, you know, I, I adopt the Philip K. Dick version of reality. It's anything that doesn't go away, no matter how much we will it to do otherwise. And moral truths don't go away, no matter how much you will them to be otherwise. You can't will the truth of slavery to be that slavery is actually moral. Nobody can will the truth of slavery to be that slavery is actually moral because it is just objectively immoral. So that's what I mean when I talk about truth. So I really take issue with that objectively immoral, you say, but on the other hand, and here's why I think epistemology is important, because I think that uh, my disagreement with Sam Harris would be uh, of his definition of truth in, his, in a very uh, scientific manner. That is, this is something that you can test. This is something that you can see, feel, you know, sort of the empiricist version of truth. And I think we need to be clear whether, you know, you are agreeing with that empiricist version or not. So no, I don't, I don't think that truths, that, that um, moral truths are like scientific truths in the way that they can be tested. I think that we can test a moral truth in the sense of like, you know, you can ask the question, is, is, is holocausting people wrong? And then you can look at a holocaust and say, yep, it's definitely wrong. Like you can gain information about the nature of a moral of a behavior and whether it's moral or immoral by looking at instances of that behavior. But you can't build a machine that will measure the immorality of the Holocaust and say, here's how many utils of unhappiness this thing produced. Here's the proof that it is not ethical. So it's not provable in those kinds of ways, but it is empirical in the sense that it draws on empirical information and is a claim about the world. So I would be more sympathetic to saying something like, and again, I don't want to get too far into it, but something closer to like the Kantian synthetic a priori truths where moral claims are neither genuinely analytic nor genuinely um, empirical in the sense of non-evaluative uh, factual claims. They are in a unique class of evaluative claims that are truth effective and are related to features of reality that are truth, um, that are, that are value related. Well, that's interesting because when I disagree with moral realism, I define truth in at the very Sam Harris sort of way which is that I think that you cannot, um, you know, that moral truths are not scientific. Uh, you know, I have some axioms and all I need uh, to, for, you know, someone like Sam Harris to do is to say that uh, you are deriving all of your arguments from an axiom and that axiom is which would reduce the well-being of human beings. And, you know, so it is, in, it is an odd axiom, you know, so it's not in that sense scientific, but it's it's definitely something that we sort of aspire towards. So I think that uh, that is where my disagreements would sort of um, lie. So, I mean, I think, I think I agree with you there. I think the difference between you and I is you believe that we construct and select our axioms whereas i believe that we learn about and discover our axioms that like they're not axioms in the sense of something that you adopt without justification i think the moral foundations are justifiable and our belief in them can be justified um in a way that makes them more than you know i'm not sure if by axiom you mean assumption but often people say axiom they mean we're just going to assume this because it's useful to assume it and then go from there um and that's not how i believe moral foundations work i think they are you know, they're axioms in the sense that like A equals A is an axiom, right? It's a fundamental truth about the nature of reality. Um, but it is that they genuinely tend to involve content that is more synthetic than purely logical statements like A equals A or, you know, stuff, stuff like that. On the uh, discovery part, you know, let me put forward a sort of evolutionary argument from it. So I think that uh, primarily there are two moral systems, the consequentialist and the deontological moral system. Uh, 
and I do not think that one of them and my second proposition would be that both of them are contradictory to each other. And, uh, you know, you can argue for something like threshold deontology, you know, leaving that aside. So uh, my third proposition would be that often we as human beings uh, are not consistent on what approach we take when it comes to real life situations. Sometimes we make deontological judgment, sometimes we make consequentialist judgment. Let's say the for instance, the trolley problem, you know? Uh, so for instance, if I was, if I had to just look at it from an outsider perspective and then, you know, ask someone else to pull it, then I would say that uh, I would hurt the one person to save the other uh, five person. But if the one person was someone I know, I wouldn't do it. So on first aspect I use the consequentialist approach and in the second aspect I use the uh, the ontological approach and I think that uh, this is also verified by the fact that our brains are divided in such a way that uh, one part of our brain controls the empiricist uh, part of it you know sometimes we make judgments rationally but when it comes to someone close to us we make judgments emotionally so my argument would be that when these two facts are contradictory it is uh, near impossible to arrive at moral truths given what we know about uh, these two competing philosophical thoughts so that would be an argument possibly for a claim that we lack access to the moral truths in certain situations. We wanna be careful here and distinguish between access arguments. Can we get to the moral truths and grounding arguments? What makes them the moral truth versus not the moral truth, right? So it might be the case, for example, that utilitarianism is just correct, right? Like just objectively the case. I don't think it is, but that's where that could be the case, right? And if that were the case, what you just described is a situation in which human beings sometimes get the right ethical answers and sometimes get the wrong ethical answers because of our mixed evolutionary upbringing, right? Um, that might be the way things are, right? I don't think it's exactly right. I think there's a couple of issues that I would raise with like parts of the sort of theory you just laid out there, but like broadly, I think, you know, what I would say, how I would characterize the world is like this. Um, there are a plurality, there are multiple, so there are multiple moral foundations that you correctly recognize can be in tension with each other, right? So freedom can be in tension with safety, for example, or um, producing suffering, unnecessary suffering may in some ways be in tension with promoting flourishing because you want to have a liberal society to promote flourishing, but it causes some degree of unnecessary suffering. You're always in tension with these kinds of issues. And then what I think happens in a healthy moral framework is you do your best to find a balance between those competing moral intuitions, those moral foundations. And, um, you know, there are a couple of potential, there are probably likely in many cases, multiple acceptable ways that you could balance those concerns and then a bunch of ways in which would be very unacceptable, right? So it's okay for you to have a society where people can exchange some of their free time for our goods and services, but you don't want to go so far as having slavery, right? And you don't want to go so far as preventing any modes of exchange or something like that. So it's looking for these kinds of balances between those moral foundations. It's not... So like the conflicts between them is not proof that any of them are false because they're all pro tanto defeasible moral foundations, right? To say all things being equal, one ought to promote flourishing is not to say that it's also not true that like all things being equal, one ought to reduce unnecessary suffering and that those two things might be in tension sometimes. Those are all true claims, I think. Um, how do you decide what is uh, an objective morally true claim and what isn't? 
Yeah, I mean, that's hard work, right? That's practical. Um, so if you're talking about like an applied situation, right, you're doing cost benefit analyses and weighing, you know, trying to unpack as many of the fact moral factors involved and weighing them against each other and how much they weigh. This gets into like um, Francis Cam's work on um, um, the way that different moral factors can have different weights and can, you know, sort of impact each other in weird ways in different situations. So there's no, there's no easy formula that we can put together that says, you know, figure out how much utility will be produced, figure out how much autonomy will be violated, figure out how much flourishing and then math them together and get a right answer. Um, it's more like, you know, we go into a situation and what we don't want to do is just completely ignore certain moral concerns, right? We don't want to say, well, all that matters is we protect the environment. So if I have to murder a bunch of people to do it, I don't care. That doesn't matter at all. All right. It has to matter. I think some in your moral consideration. And so you end up having to come up with a compromise that, you know, protects the environment while protecting the well-being of the individuals involved. So you're doing those kind of trade-offs. And the reality, I think, for our ethical judgments is we do the best we can. We hope we're getting it right. And we may never know if we actually got it right a lot of the time. Like the reality is you may get to the end of your life still wondering, did I totally fuck that up? <laughs> right. And that's the way it is. But I don't think that means that we don't have access to the truth. I think it means that the truth is very, very difficult to get access to. And we may not be certain that we ever got full access to it. But I think there are some cases where we know we got it right. Like, I think there are some situations where you just know, you know, I had a moral choice, I did the right thing, and I'm happy that I did the right thing, even if there were costs. Um, and yeah, I think you can get there through things like debate, reflective equilibrium, internal introspection, consideration of your own intuitions, but you're never going to have like an easy hand about, handout formula that you can just give to people to fix their ethical concerns. I'm, I'm just trying to unpack that um, mm -hmm. because I think that the burden of proof is sometimes often laid on the sort of moral anti-realists. We are supposed to prove why moral truths don't exist, but I think that the burden of truth uh, de is dependent on the claimant based on what we know, you know, the... No, I, I disagree. I think the burden of truth is pretty frequently on the realists. Because we're mm -hmm. making the positive claim. We're claiming that a thing exists. So it's our yeah, obligation I, to prove it. Well, yes. And uh, uh, so I, I want to know what is your starting assumption? Because uh, are you, do you think that is, is it that uh, we ought to maximize well-being? We ought to do the greatest good for the greatest number? what is the moral truth that everyone should agree on if there is one? Well, no, I think there's this cluster, like I said, of, of uh, pro tanto moral foundations that include that essentially, I, I think it would be fair to say that all, all of the moral theories, the normative theories people are familiar with, utilitarianism, deontology, virtue theory, care ethics, rights-based approaches, all of these get at, a key value, a key moral foundation that really does matter. They're all true in this kind of sense, right? But they're all intention and they're all defeasible. And so it's not that I started from utilitarianism or deontology. I start from utilitarianism is capturing something that matters. Deontology is capturing something that matters. So is virtue theory. How do we balance these things together and come up with an answer that's remotely satisfying to us? Um, and how we do that is a bunch of, you know, struggle and reflection and hypotheticals and empirical data and, and wrestling around and doing the best we can. Um, I don't think, in that way, I don't think that like, the process is all that different than what some constructivists have in mind when they think of the process of bringing about our moral understanding. It's just that I think that we are getting at truth rather than sort of making it up and declaring it true in this way. Like I think we're, we're gaining access to certain kinds of knowledge when we learn about the nature of morality.
I would define reality as uh, something which is which remains too independent of our existence, you or my existence. You know, whether we are here or not, reality would exist. But we know, and I think uh, Jonathan Aid has written an excellent book on it, The Righteous uh, Mind. And he argues that uh, reality, uh, our moral truths are in fact divided in a very, you know, the five factor, you know, truth, fairness, justice, those kind of stuff. I, I'm so familiar with it. So uh, I think when we see that we have evolved moral intuitions, which are uh, clearly influenced by the environment that we grew up in, it essentially means that those sort of our moral intuitions are not uh, independent of us, that if we did not exist, these moral intuitions would not exist. If we did not evolve in a particular way, our we wouldn't have the same moral mm -hmm. intuitions. Mm -hmm. So what is your response to that? Yes, yeah, so there's a couple of things we clarified there. And this is where I think Schaefer Landau's realism of defense is incredibly valuable. And also, I think, you know, I did, uh, I wrote a master's thesis defending more realism against the evolutionary debunking argument, which is what you're sort of tiptoeing up to here, right? So those are two uh, separate concerns. The first one I'll say is, I think your definition of real is not quite right, right? I think you when you define it in terms of us not existing, um, I think that is too narrow. I, what I think is that this belief independent idea that like reality is the thing that exists independent of our beliefs about it is different than, it's so close to what the intuition is that you are getting at, but wouldn't exclude, um, you know, like on your view, claims about human psychology are not claims about reality because they wouldn't be true if our human psychology didn't exist but that seems false it seems to me that claims about human psychology are empirical claims about our evolved psychological nature so it's not the case that a truth has to be true independent of our physical existence it's that it has to be true independent of our beliefs about that truth so for example the psychological claim that human beings evolved their moral understanding right is a claim about our minds and our behavior and it is a true claim i think right it's an objectively true claim um so this but you know but it wouldn't be it would it so but it isn't belief dependent, right? We can't believe it to be the case that our, our morality didn't evolve and have as actually changed that claim about our morality as a result. So that's the first part. Does that make sense in terms of clarifying uh, the difference between yeah. stance, stance or belief independence and independent of our physical or, or, or you know, metaphysical existence? Um, yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. So you, you wanted, you had a second part. Yes, the second part is just the response to the evolutionary debunking argument, which is, uh -huh. I don't believe it is true that because we evolved our moral senses evolutionarily, that that not denies us access to objective moral truth. I think the, we are very lucky in that we evolved as a pro-social creature, things like an understanding of fairness, um, that while imperfect, gives us access to the moral realm of consideration. And from there, we can use our reasoning and our judgment to develop our, to weed out our bad beliefs, our bad evolved moral beliefs, like, you know, taking people as slaves is okay and sexual assault is okay, um, and, and replace those with better moral beliefs based on a mix of our evolved reasoning and our evolved moral psychology. Um, essentially in the same way that we take our limited and flawed individual understanding of things like statistics and then use education and habituation to make ourselves and others in society better at doing statistics on both, you know, an individual and a group scale. Yeah, so I think that uh, our understanding of uh, reality is limited and constrained by our circumstances and the way we evolved mm -hmm. and that necessarily entails that there are some moral truths that perhaps no matter how hard we try we might not arrive yeah. at because uh, you know we not we're we evolved beings like every other beings we have our limitations um, i totally think, agree 
and one of the problem that your argument has another problem that your argument has is that of free will and you seem to believe that free will doesn't exist and yet hold a sort of more realist position and those seem contradictory to me okay why do they seem contradictory to you i'm curious well, because if free will exists, then everything that I do is a result. If free will doesn't exist, and everything that I do is a result of events and circumstances that I had no control over. So mm-hmm. what I do and the moral intuitions that I have a form are, at the end of the day, result of the circumstances that I was grown up and raised up in. So in in, a, in, in this situation there is no such thing for me at least as an individual and an objective moral right or wrong okay so i was with you right up there until the very end i agree there is no independent self or person um what i think might be helpful here is the distinction between moral truths and moral responsibility okay i think that there are objective moral truths that we gain access to through our understanding whether we have moral responsibility for our actions is a separate and very very complicated question right it could be, and it here's it is important it could be the case and i think it is the case that we have access to the moral truth but our moral responsibility is highly highly compromised and really problematic okay so how would that play out right think about you know, a child raised in 1930s Germany, right? They don't have access to the moral truth that like Jews are people, right? They're just not going to get that access and they're going to be wrong about it. But what they're doing is still immoral, right? It's still bad to be part of the Holocaust, even if you had no control over being born and raised in Nazi Germany, being brainwashed into being a Nazi youth, being, you know, working at an SS, you know, at a concentration camp or something like that, right? if if that is correct then it so like again you might argue that they had free will right what i'm saying is if you take for granted that they don't have free will i still think it's very obvious that they could be doing something objectively immoral even if it is the result of factors beyond their control um so that's the sort of response to the problem yeah uh, i was trying to think there's something i feel like like there was something else there that you're asking about but i dropped it sorry does that, does that make sense in terms of how free no free will could be compatible with more like i think moral judgments are entirely separate from judgments of moral responsibility in the sense that whether you did something wrong is a fact of the matter that we can assess and then we have to separately ask are you being should be should you be held morally responsible for that action i do think that is an important uh distinction but uh, uh well I, this isn't something that I believe in, but this is, I think, one of the objections that will come across in your, to all moral realists who happen to be also atheists, which is that if there is no transcendent reality, on what basis do you uh, base your moral truths on? Yeah, so I mean, I have very little concern about this sort of divine command or the like you know if there is no god then there is no objective morality argument i think it's a very bad argument um i think the if anything the uh, the divine command theorists have a much harder time dealing with the euthyphro dilemma the dilemma of is something good because we say it's good or do we say it's good because it is good which is really the dilemma that you and i've been wrestling with here for this this whole time um i think it makes more sense to say something is good. We say something is good because it is good. And that is true, not just for us, but for God itself, that if God existed, it would have to be the case that there is a fact, there are moral truths that constrain God's nature rather than the other way around. So a lot of um, folks like William Lane Craig will say, it's God's true nature that defines the moral truth. But I think that just pushes the regress back one step. And we have to ask what constrains God's nature such that God can't will that genocide is moral. And the answer is that genocide is immoral, whether or not God thinks so. At best, God can be a perfect, 
if he's like, let's say that God is truly omniscient, right? Then God is a perfect weather vane for morality, but not its source, right? God could be a, a, a source of access to the moral truth, but he can't be the ground of the moral truth. I also think that uh, the infinite regress part is something that comes up in Sam Harris arguments as well. I think that uh, he also right. falls back into this trap and uh, the, the same is our distinction, especially the ones who say that uh, science can tell us about moral values. I think they have a major problem because uh, mm -hmm. of these, uh, you know, this hum hymn skeleton, which uh, you seem to have no problem with, uh, come finding it yes. with yours. This, this, this is why I don't, um, you know, Harris, I think you can give Harris credit for maybe mapping out one version of the kind of pluralism, the normative pluralism that I've been describing. I, I wouldn't use the the way that he does it, where he's like, here's a peak for equity and here's a peak for fairness. I think of it more like a giant plateau, right? Where it's like around the ring of the plateau, you have justice and fairness and all these things and moving towards one moves you away from the other. But like, if you go off the, you know, off the plateau is the, in a sense, like if I completely abandon fairness for the sake of utility, right, I, then I've stepped over the edge of the plateau and into what I think of as objectively immoral terrain. But inside the plateau, I think there's a bunch of positions that are all objectively ethically true because they are different reasonable compromises between those various foundations around it. Let me just add one other thing here. Um, you know, we, we were talking about like the Nazi kid, right? It's just as true that you could be stuck with lack of access to certain non-moral truths as is true of moral claims. So like your ability to get access to basic empirical claims is also entirely dependent on your social situation. If you were raised in a fundamentalist, you know, Christian household that didn't allow you to learn about science, and like, let's say you were in a world where no one was teaching science because they were all fundamentalist Christians, you're never going to have access to the true age of the planet, right? That doesn't make the true age of the planet any less true. It just screws over you as an individual for having that lack of access. Same is true for someone born in Germany, right? Like they're just, they have the very bad moral luck of being in, stuck in that situation and you know, having the kind of human psychology that makes it highly unlikely that you're going to be the one in a hundred person or the one in a thousand people who like tries to join the white rose rather than just be, you know, going along to get along. I'm trying to think the consequences of that, uh, because I think mm -hmm. that will have some real life consequences in how we treat people. Mm -hmm. um, I would hope it so, yeah. Does, <laughs> Because it does sort of, uh, I, I think that maps on perfectly to the argument against capital punishment or harsher prison, uh, maybe prison reforms and things like that. Because Absolutely. at the end of the day, the individual is not entirely uh, responsible for his claim. But can we objectively say that, uh, say, a psychopath who has no moral conscience is, you know, can we have some understanding of him of a psychopath without being um, sort of without arguing for the fact that you know what he did is as well as arguing for the fact that what he did is morally abhorrent so i'm i'm trying to yes. think where the line between responsibility uh, stops like where we should draw the line so to me at the end of the day, talking about moral responsibility becomes a fairly pragmatic matter. Does talking about moral responsibility improve the situation in some way? For you or I, it does because we are built in such a way where we are responsive to moral judgment and moral considerations and so can be compelled to some degree by moral argument. Right. If you have an individual like a like a genuinely true antisocial personality disorder doesn't understand moral judgment is just not going to like it's, you know, has an empathy deficiency such that they really can't grasp why other people matter in a fundamental way. Um, you're not. You know what they're what they can what they do is immoral their actions are immoral but i don't think it's meaningful to talk about 
like robust moral responsibility for them. What we would say is what their actions are wrong, um, but they're not um, talking about like how we would reform them is probably not going to make much sense depending on how you depending on the like the empirical information about it like if you if you if it was the case for example that talking about moral responsibility with and around individuals with these particular disorders would actually improve their behavior then it's useful to do so um but at the end of the day i think, I think another thing that is is probably trips people up here where a lot of folks are familiar probably with the idea ought implies can like, um, you know, if you can't fulfill a moral obligation, then you don't actually have the moral obligation is the way this idea is often understood. Um, and there are some situations in which that might be true, but I don't think it's true in all cases, right? I don't think it's true that if you have a sociopath who is psychologically incapable of understanding their moral obligations, that they therefore don't have them is a false inference. Um, really what, it, what it's about, the claim is um, moral responsibility implies can, right? What we mean when we say ought implies can is um, whether we hold somebody morally responsible for their actions depends on to what extent we can say, um, you know, they had the ability to do this certain thing and to what extent saying that they had moral responsibility will impact their behavior and other people's behavior going forward. So like those are the considerations I think that are driving uh, that, um, you know, I, I bite the bullet here. I've, I've talked about this before and say, look, there's a lot of ways in which a sociopath is like a volcano. It's immoral for a volcano to erupt and murder all a bunch of people, right? But there's no moral responsibility to be assigned there. It's just bad that it happens. It's, it's, it's terrible in this kind of way, in the same way that when a sociopath murders a bunch of people, it's immoral. But like if they are genuinely so damaged, um, another example that comes up a lot is like an individual who gets a tumor in their brain that turns them into a pedophile. There's a actual genuine story that this happened where like a high school teacher started having pedophiliac urges and like eventually they figured out it was because he had a tumor in his brain. Um, having pedophiliac urges is immoral, right? It's bad. Um, but we wouldn't assign moral responsibility to him or something like that in that situation, I don't think. Well, I think that um, puts me in a sort of real life uh, case study of, uh, you know, th there's this guy on YouTube, uh, he's a Christian missionary called David Wood, and I think he's been uh, diagnosed with antisocial personality disorder. And he openly says that the only reason I'm not killing people or hurting anyone is because uh, I will be punished in the afterlife. So do you think that in a situation like this, where you cannot appeal to the moral conscience of a, someone diagnosed with ASPD, uh, in a situation like this, is the retort to religious um, reasons, scripture justified? Do you, do you mean like, do we need the threat of hell to justify our actions? I'm not sure I understand what you, or, or like no, to scare people into acting properly? Yeah, well, that the second one. In, yeah, especially I, no. In the case. <laughs> no, right. So my answer not here for is us. No. I'm, I'm talking uh, for a sociopath. About, yeah. Yeah. So, right. So you might make the argument. Well, look, if this person like there, there are varying degrees of antisocial personality disorder. Not all of them are like you know, violent um, uh, serial killers, right? A lot of them are, as people like to joke, used car salesmen and CEOs. Um, so in those cases, what we want to do is by hook or by crook, right? Motivate them to act as morally as we could possibly get them to act. And if that means, you know, making them really high functioning egoists who like, manage to tie their self interest to enough other people that they don't do something horrible, then maybe that's the best that we can do in that situation. We're still cobbling. So there's one of my favorite quotes by Nagel is that there's really no sufficient um uh there's no sufficient alternative for genuine concern for the well-being of others, right? You can't you can't ever, I think, fully make up for having just that kind of correct, you know, rightly developed concern for the well-being of others, but you can cobble together something that will at least prevent the worst of the horrors that some people might commit if they really genuinely buy into the idea that like they have no moral obligations and can do whatever they want. Yeah, well, 
I, I would agree with that. And I think that if we are in a situation, like I'm talking about this particular case, that is if we are in a situation where a person, you know, where let's say tomorrow it's conclusively proven that God doesn't exist. Do you mm-hmm. think the world would be objectively a worse place because then we'll have people like uh, David Wood going on killing people because now they would have no reason to stop? I doubt it. No, I mostly doubt it. And the much, for much the same reason that I don't worry that when I teach my students that they don't have free will, that they're going to turn into serial killers. The reason that you're not a serial killer isn't because you believe you have free will. It's because you don't want to kill people and you are very strongly averse and hardwired against killing people. And you have a bunch of societal situ- stuff that is going to like make your life much, much worse if you were to kill people. And so all of those things are what is preventing you from killing people. It's not, and and like, I think, are there some people in the world who probably act differently because they're afraid of God for sure, right? Most of them act in irrational and terrified ways because of it. And they mostly do more harm than good, I think, because of that. But like it does alter people's behavior, but it's a very bad way to manipulate people into acting ethically, in my opinion. I think it would be much better to put aside all the God stuff and help them understand actual moral truths and help them build their moral foundations on something solid. Because if you build it on God, then as like you said, you know, if someone really is basing all of their moral understanding on the belief that God exists, and then you take that away from them, they are in in likely going to crash. And I've talked to a lot of atheists who came out of religion where they they struggled with nihilism after they left religion because they had so bought into this idea that they needed God to be the ground of moral truth. And so without God, there really must not be any moral truth. And so it's fine for them to do whatever they want. And, and that plus, you know, a lifetime of repression led to spirals of addiction or spirals of abuse or something like that that they then had to work their way out of where it would have been much better if they had just been properly brought up to care about morality for morality's sake and not because someone is threatening them with a really bad time afterwards. Also because belief in religion as it exists does not really give you better morals than say uh, secular humanism because you know you can make a solid case if you believe in religion truly that uh, to be a misogynist, to be a homophobe, you know, to support slavery, you know, all of those cases can be made uh, from a scriptural perspective. But if you face yeah. a morality... Uh, I'm, a, I'm a little skeptical of this argument because there's so much so many examples of people using secular morality to come up with really horrible claims, like a lot of really bad things that have happened in the last 200 years have been based on a kind of secular morality. So I, I do think it is the case that secular morality has a better chance of getting access to more moral truths. Oh, that's bad. Hello. Hi. You there? Um, you got out there. Um, I stayed in the room, I think. Yeah, it's I think connection problem. Uh if you can repeat the last line. Sure. So what I was saying is I think that I, I, I would shy away from the argument that um religion cannot be a foundation for a healthy morality. I think it is more likely the case that a secular foundation will produce better results, but it's also the case that a secular foundation can produce really terrible results. Uh, Great. Good to go now. Uh, Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, I'll try that again. Um, so I do think it is the case that more that secular moral foundations are better than religious moral foundations in the sense that they are based on true claims about the world rather than fictional claims about the existence of a god. And so they are stronger in that sense. But I also think it's the case that like 
you can use secular foundations to get to really horrible places if you reason poorly, just like you can use religious foundations to get to a really good place if you reason very well. So I think I know I've, I've known lots of very ethical religious people who got there on the basis of, you know, taking the good stuff and leaving out the bad stuff, which is what I think religious ethicists often do. And I think that's, and it's not that different in a lot of ways from what secular ethicists do when they weigh different trade-offs and balancing in their system. I So like, I do think better a secular ethics than a religious one, but better a religious ethics than no ethics at all. Yeah, well, I think that last point is, uh, you know, when I was deep into this new atheist thing, I thought like most people that the world would be a better place without religion. And now I think that the world will be uh, the same without religion, essentially, that, will, that is, we'll have the same problems, we'll just have different justifications for it. Um, is that something that you agree with? Sorry, say it again, I'm trying to understand what you're saying there. Well, I'm saying that uh, I don't think that the world will be necessarily a better place without religion. I think that the uh -huh. world will remain the same with or without religion, that will have the same problems, will just have different uh, justifications for it. That is, we won't use scriptures to justify it, but we'll have something else. I think yes and no. I mean, I think like if we imagined a world where all religious systems of morality were immediately replaced by secular systems of morality rather than like a vacuum formed or something, you know, there's two ways that this could go, right? Either it's like religion gets raptured one moment and we just have the same world, but like nobody has any religious beliefs or like imagining a world in which, you know, we either like people just stop being religious and like slowly over time, 98% of the population replaces their religious beliefs with a secular morality, right? I think that would be a better world consistently. I think it's likely to say, likely to be the case that that world would be better than one where a majority of people are using religion as their moral foundations. So I don't think it's the case that the two worlds are likely to be exactly the same, but it is the case that in that secular world, you're still going to have a bunch of moral conflicts because there's these tensions between these moral foundations. There's going to be disagreement about what the right balance is. There's going to be conflict over those balancing acts. So like you're still going to have challenges. I think you're going to be better equipped to address them. Yeah, well, I would uh, rephrase and agree with that. I think there are some issues which uh, I think are not religious in nature, but which we'll still have say racism, for instance, but I, I also I do think that uh, because of where we are now, you know, I believe in Pinker's ideas that the world is progressing and, you know, hating that we'll have a sort of um, upward speak. And so I think that uh, a world without religion, you know, it pragmatically would, is going to be better than a world um, with religion in it as it exists right now. Um, so I think uh, in, in, your, in your podcast, you have uh, discussed a lot of these and on your Twitter feed, a lot of these IDW figures. So I, um, you know, just for popular, because I'm, a, I'm so people would like to know what you think about them right now, what you think about the movement in general. Um, do you think it's similar to new atheism and how exactly do you think it's different? Oh, it's a complicated question. Um, I mean, I think the IDW is a disaster, but I think it was a disaster from the start. I think most of the people in it were going into it as the disasters and people were just in denial about that for a long period of time. Um, I think new atheism was a another from what i gather fairly much pretty much a disaster um you know i, I hear i'll say new atheism at least probably kicked off a round of spreading of atheist community that is good like i think you can we can say that the popularity did bring more young people into the atheist movement in a way that is valuable it also pushed a bunch of people out of the atheist movement because it was toxic towards women and minorities in various kinds of ways. Not everybody in the movement, but certainly some people and certainly headliners like Sam Harris and 
Dawkins created a space that felt very toxic to a lot of people and was very toxic to a lot of people. And that more broadly, I would say new atheism played into a sort of approach to atheism that gins up happiness amongst the atheists, but is not very productive or valuable, I think, because it tends to be a lot of like dunking on the religious in ways that I think isn't particularly constructive. So like there are lots of problems with both. And it's definitely the case that there is a there is an overlapping contingent of predominantly young white men, but not all you know, but mostly a lot of young men who were attracted to atheism because it allowed them to push back on religion and feel smart about that. And were also attracted to things like Gamergate um, because it allowed them to push back on what they felt like was um, an invasion of their personal space by other people's justice beliefs. Um, and that those, those communities that that section of the atheist movement of the atheist world very much um, transitions, I think, into being a core of the base of the intellectual dark web and kind of epitomizing the kind of rationalist bros that um, sort of make some online spaces very intolerable a lot of the time. Um, so I guess that's that's where I think all of those things have come together at this point. Well, I'm not exactly sure because New Atheism was a very diverse movement in a way because it had people from a lot of different sorts of political inclinations and stuff. And also it had uh, in people like Dawkins and uh, say Dennett have actual original works that are, you know, sort of, you know, they were already known in their field. So it, it also right. acted as a way of introducing a lot of people to evolutionary biology or to philosophy. I think Daniel Dennett had great philosophical arguments in the book, in his uh, books, and as well as Missile Andre, who is not talked about, but was a part of the New Atheist movement, uh, the French author. So I think what happened is, uh, I don't know if you agree with this, uh, that there was a sort of subset of the movement which was primarily active on YouTube. You know, all of those talk, uh, Hitchens, uh, Destroys, those kind of videos. And the similarity between that and IDW, I would say is the simplistic framing of arguments. You know, it, it, it was performative in nature rather than sort mm -hmm. of argue more based on philosophical arguments or rationality. So I think those sort of that community, a lot of people in that community, I think you can fairly argue went to the IDW camp, but a lot of those who were actually uh, reading the stuff or were intellectually involved in the movement uh, sort of uh, continue to remain in the leftist uh, or, or liberal space. Yeah, I mean, I think that's right. I, I don't I don't have numbers. I don't think anybody has numbers on like mm. how many people really split to the woke versus the anti woke when this divide happened. I do think it's fair to say around elevator gate a schism and, and afterwards a schism happened and that schism widened. And I think it's important. So so Dennett is very different than Harris and Dawkins. And I don't think it's not it's, it's complicated, right, because you have those three plus Hitchens is the four horsemen, which are the sort of headliners of the new atheist movement, which is its own problem because your headliners are four white dudes. Um, but like Dennett is very much a like genuine, serious philosopher, right? And I think it's also important to note that like Dennett has not waded into the culture wars in the way that Dawkins and Harris have. He is pretty much stuck to doing his philosophy of mind Daniel Dennett kind of stuff. Um, and I have plenty of philosophical disagreements with Daniel Dennett on philosophy of mind, but like he's not he's not part of this conversation for the most part, right? He like was part of the four horsemen, I guess, but like people like him and he didn't do a bunch of like pushback on feminism and trans rights, that sort of thing, right? Whereas Dawkins and Harris very much you know, Dawkins more than Harris, I would say, had a bit of a background beforehand, but both of them 
pivoted pretty heavily into the culture war, leaned into the culture war stuff. And I think experienced pushback in a way that made their blind spots about social justice worse. Um, and that, being the kind of centerpiece of that being sort of the center where that was getting the most attention in the movement it's understandable why why people look at that and think that morphed into the intellectual dark web if you're focused on those two then i think you have a reasonable case that like a large piece of the uh, idw's dna is the anti-woke atheist movement that was like a key piece of that part of new atheism now there's also like people like Nawaz and such who were made famous by folks like Harris, you know, who built them up, who are, like you say, from more diverse backgrounds, you have a lot of like anti uh, um, former you know, ex Muslims who um, are pushing back on religion because of their direct experiences with being oppressed by religion. Um, and like some of those people also went into the intellectual dark web, right? Essentially became part of that, became very reactionary. Nawaz promoted a range of like conspiracy theories around up, up until and after the election. Um, so like, even when you had sort of that kind of diversity within the movement, um, that kind of diversity didn't necessarily contribute to sort of avoiding the anti-woke um, spiral in my opinion. Well, I would, because we keep using this term, I walk and anti book and I don't know, but I think, I don't know what you think about this, but I think that there is a reasonable case to be made against the so-called walk uh, movement, which is, you know, there's a reasonable case to be made against uh, things like postmodernism. There's a reasonable case to be made against critical race theory. But uh, yeah, I strongly, I think that, strongly disagree on all of those for sure. You you uh, strongly disagree with what you don't you disagree that there is. A I think postmodernism is valuable. I think critical race theory is valuable. I think do you, wokeness do you, is, is a movement. Yeah. Do you think that they, uh, you cannot make a reasonable case against postmodernism or critical race theory, which doesn't dive into these sort of uh, you know sort of reactionary anti woke. Um, no, 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 no. I think you can make lots of criticisms of critical race theory and lots of criticisms of postmodernism, just like you can literally any other theory like the ones we've talked about this whole time, right? They are no different than moral realism in that kind of sense. There are lots of good criticisms to raise against moral realism, but the, the fact that you can raise criticisms against the theory does not make it a bad theory unless those criticisms are like de decisive, right? And very rarely do you have decisive knockdown arguments in a lot of these kinds of debates. Um, but also, I just think it's the case that like postmodernism correctly um, addressed certain problems about thinking, especially in the period in which it was most prominent, and critical race theory correctly addresses a variety of social problems and is corroborated by a, a bunch of empirical evidence. So it's just like they're not even close to being some sort of silly thing that is dangerous in that kind of way. They're very well established um, theoretical frameworks that are productive in a variety of ways. Yeah, well, the problem is I don't exactly know what a person means when they say things like postmodernism or critical race theory, because often they would uh, mean, say critical race theory and mean the works of uh, Robin D'Angelo, with whom I disagree. But often they would mean the works of Charles Mills, who has a more sort of nuanced, complex, uh, and I would say reasonable view of this. And same with postmodernism, you know, we are presented often with a caricature and otherwise there is, but I think that in the internet space, especially in the IDW space, the reason I have not seen any reasonable or robust intellectual criticisms against either of those. What I see is just a reactionary, you know, sort of black sliding. Oh, I totally know? agree. Yeah. Well, also, let me say, even broken clocks can be right occasionally. So I think you can probably, you know, if you sift through new discourses long enough, you will find 
at least a reproduction of someone else's accurate criticism of critical race theory or postmodernism or something like that. But I think you're right to say that the overwhelming amount of the content that is being produced by the IDW involves mischaracterizations or straw mans or catastrophizing about um, poorly understood theories, um, mostly as a way to promote a moral panic uh, for the sake of pushing back on I, what they, what I think most of them genuinely think is its own moral panic in the form of wokeness, though I think they're just wrong about that. I think to me, wokeness is just the next term for the next phase of social justice that we're all doing, where we try to integrate all of these complicated theories into a system that allows us to improve people's quality of life and reduce reduce injustice in the world. Well, surprisingly, the reactionary movement started out by, you know, attempting to do a sort of same thing, you know, if you read the uh, Mondius small book, you know, Curtis Evans' work or Nick Land's work, you know, they happen to be very reactionary, very, very fringe people, but when uh, a lot of their philosophical sense, you know, I think they're also philosophically grounded in the sense that they do make a good case uh, drawing from the works of the postmodernists, say Derrida or Foucault. Nick Land is openly, you know, inspired by their views in Derrida and Foucault and all the postmodernist, his the accelerationism is in fact a sort of postmodernism movement. So it's sort of ironic that uh, the same sort of people are now opposing this, you know, leftist postmodernism. Right. And to my understanding, folks like James Lindsay are heavily influenced by Moldbug and the reactionaries. So like it's ironic that they're they're in a sense both taking neo they're, they're both neo postmodernists in that kind of sense, right? The, the people who are criticizing the postmodernists are themselves deriving. And this is like, this is why I think a lot of this is very silly is because I think a lot of the insights of postmodernism are just taken for granted by most individuals these days that like the critiques of, um, you know, unity of narrative and stuff are very widespread at this point. And like, this is true, I think, of most movements that like, you know, critical race theory, you can look at the major themes in critical race theory and see the way that they have been integrated a lot into a bunch of people's thinking, even if the people don't identify as getting it from critical race theory, it just sort of diffuses into the academic and cultural consciousness. Um, so yeah, I think, and this is why I am also a little like, we can talk about these different theories and how they relate to each other and stuff. But most of the time, you know, the problem that the people on the ground have is not they're worried that someone's not accurately teaching Derrida or something is that they're being told by Fox News that like their children are being told to hate themselves because they're white. You know, like that's the level of discourse that they are being taught is what's going on. And that's not going to be addressed by saying, well, look, if you read this passage from Mills, right, you can clearly see that he's not saying that they're not going to take that as like oh, well, now I'm no longer worried about this, especially because they're being told by folks like James Lindsay that um, if somebody tells you this is not what the goal is, they're lying, right? Like anybody who cites sources is just using them to confuse you. It's all a lie. Just trust us that what they're trying to do is destroy you because you're white. And like there's I no think, way to argue with that. <laughs> I, think, I think the reasons they make that argument is because the worst part of it, you know, people say like, D'Angelo, Robin D'Angelo, or, you know, people more to defend of that, do make that parody-like sort of arguments. And they, are, they would say that they are responding to that and not uh, postmodernism or critical race theory in a sort of academic sense. So, you know, they're attacking the that, popular... Right, which is just that, right. <laughs> But that's just a fancy way to straw man your opponents, right? Is to say, oh, I'm only working, I'm only looking at the very extreme fringe. I'm not talking about the vast majority of people. But the problem is they do it as a Mott and Bailey, right? They'll say, oh, we're just talking about Robin D'Angelo, but then they'll release like a list of bad words and it'll be things like equity and like normativity, right? Which is not just looking at the fringe. It's really a critique of 
a large, you know, like the idea that history needs to be taught in such a way where people are aware of the ethical consequences of things that happened, right? They are very much more broad in what they are actually going after. Um, now, like, I think it's okay to be critical of Robin D'Angelo, or especially like, um, what her name, Rao, or whatever her name is, the ones who are like really making a lot of money and feel like they are kind of grifting off of the social justice movement it would be weird if there weren't grifters in the social justice movement right like can you imagine a movement that didn't have grifters I, I don't think they'd ever exist um but i think it's just wrong to say that robin d'angelo makes up the um core of wokeness or is very popular amongst woke people or is driving policy in, in a lot of schools or something like that i think it's a much more complicated picture than that i was you know i just i i am taking a bunch of classes in this stuff in my own graduate education and nobody is assigning robin d'angelo or ibram kendi they're not they're not viewed as being sort of heavyweight thinkers they got popular um because our society takes up pop culture versions of ideas and likes to make them a fad for a little while but like robin d'angelo is mostly done now i think like she's going to continue to make her money but i don't think she's a force in any kind of way i don't see her impacting people's policy or behavior or even people talking about her outside of like having these explicit culture war conversations anymore I think the response to that would be that uh, the in the academic sense we can uh, the the academic definition of critical race theory or Charles Mills and Derek Bell uh, those kind of books are not the ones that are on say Amazon bestseller lists so people. Uh, the likes of Robin DiAngelo and Ibram X. Kendi, you know, they're the ones who are hitting the list. So they are the most popular version of uh, the anti-racist movement, which is why they need to be countered. I'm not saying you shouldn't counter them, but I think there is a fixation on them that is very unhealthy. Like if you look at the amount of citations on new discourses, it is overwhelmingly about Robin D'Angelo as if she is the most important threat to the world right now, when I just think you're giving her more power than she really actually has. Like, yes, they were on the New York Times list. So is Ross Douthat and a bunch of conservatives and other people too. I, I don't think it proves a whole lot because I think, A, I think a lot of people buy books that they don't read because they think they need to buy them. Um, and B, like, I think if you actually read through the entirety of white fragility or, you know, how to be an anti-racist or stuff, they're not as bad as the, the woke, the anti-woke make them out to be. They have some cringy stuff in there, but there's also like some accurate stuff in there. There's some useful stuff in there. Um, and they're not, they're not the kind of extremists that they are being portrayed as, and they are instead taken as indicative like the idea i the impression that i get when you when i look at anti-woke material is that like me as an educator in college i'm being handed robin d'angelo like she's the bible and i'm being told you have to memorize the book of white fragility and if you argue with anything in white fragility you're cast out and then you have to go and assign white fragility to your students or something and that's just so far from reality that I think it's bad that people have spent so much time portraying that as the situation. By the way, I have to I have to go in like ten minutes, just so you know. Uh, yeah. So um, I, I just want the audience to know uh, what exactly we mean when we say critical race theory. So can you please define that? Sure. Critical race theory originally is a legal movement that arises in the late 60s and 70s in response to critical legal studies, which is a liberal attempt to try to understand why um, we're not making as much progress as we should have been on greater equity in society. Critical race theory comes along and says the problem is current laws though they are colorblind they do not take into account the history of systemic racism and oppression and things like that that are reproducing themselves in worse consequences so essentially it's a a framework for trying to understand how a system that looks nominally post-racial is still reproducing systemically racial 
in in equal outcomes, racially speaking, or in inequitable outcomes, um, racially speaking, then critical race theory as a legal field um, gets picked up and adapted by various educational theorists. So there's educational critical race theory, which is folks like Ladston Billings um, and Yoso and other folks like that who take these same ideas about things like interest convergence and intersectionality and such and apply them in the educational realm. And so I think a lot of what you're seeing people getting upset about is downstream of that, essentially, of teachers being taught about how to apply these kinds of theories in their to make their pedagogy more equitable towards marginalized students. What would you say is the, are the policy prescriptions of critical race theory? There is no one policy prescription of critical race theory because it's a theoretical framework that can be, you know, applied in a bunch of different ways. Um, so like, you know, you could say um, massive redistribution of wealth that specifically targets marginalized communities could be one consequence, one implication of critical race theory, one policy implication. It could also be things like um, being in favor of affirmative action that is more that is more than just procedural affirmative action. It's preferential affirmative action. Um, it could be, um, you know, in education, it plays out in terms of shifting away from the deficit model of understanding what students need to an asset model of understanding what skills and features of their community and social capital that they have that can be drawn on for the sake of helping them excel as a student. Um, I think that's that's sort of one very straightforward example in philosophy of education that it, where it's applied. So I think, we, uh, you know, there are a lot of lawsuits against critical race theory right now in the United States. It's uh, being pursued by the likes of Chris Rufo and James Lindsay to be banned from institutes and schools. So uh, in light of the recent developments, where do you see the future of uh, critical race theory and the uh, woke movement, the so-called woke movement at large? Yeah, I mean, I don't have a lot of, I obviously don't have any respect for Chris Rufo or James Lindsay or their, their particular brand of misinformation and, and fear mongering. Um, I think what you're likely going to see is some posturing legislation from right wing types in red states where they will make it illegal to talk about various things in classrooms or they will make it ambiguous enough about whether or not it is legal that they will have a substantial chilling effect so there's what you're going to see is more inequality and asymmetry and in terms of our education system where people who are in more progressive school districts are going to get much better history educations because they're going to be their teachers are going to be allowed to teach about actual history, whereas teachers in Texas are going to in Florida are going to be hamstrung in terms of teaching just basic facts, much less controversial issues. Um, then what I think you'll probably see is you'll see a pushback to this stuff and you'll see lawsuits and a lot of these laws will be overturned as unconstitutional, as vague, as, you know, horrible in the various ways that they are. Um, and educators are going to continue to apply this stuff. It's not going to go away. It's not going to leave education departments. And it's not, you know, like if anything, you're going to drive it in more into the hidden curriculum where they're just going to not be as explicit about it, but they're not going to stop caring about how to make their pedagogy better for their marginalized students, or they're not going to stop teaching about how, um, you know, the history of marginalization is carried with us every single day, and we're still dealing with it. All right, this is going to be the last question. Um, you know, I wanted to ask you about Peter Singer's sort of expanding circle, which is that, you know, we as society goes older, we add more people into the expanding circles we have now added. You know, we will preferably add other species into our circles in the future. So uh, mm -hmm. given the sort of recent fight between the reactionaries and the uh, ones who want inclusivity, do you see that, do you think that the future is going to be more sort of inclusive, more expanding or do you think that the future will be more 
restrictive or reactionary are you optimistic about the future not not generally no um i don't know how to make predictions about the future i'm pretty horrified by the present and so like you know when i look at canada being on fire and i look at like the republicans threatening to um strip powers from anyone in their caucus who uh, you know, collaborates in any way with the Democrats to discuss the insurrection on January 6th. Like that stuff makes me really terrified that we are never going to move any farther forward or we're not going to make much more progress while we're on a ticking clock for really bad upheaval and climate change that is going to, and my concern is that it will then motivate individuals to be more insular because they are afraid of scarcity of resources. They're afraid of waves of immigrant refugee of, of um, climate refugees or something like that you know and it might promote lockdowns of borders in a way that would be very unethical i think um so who knows you know it could be the case that we continue to make progress it could be the case that like we adjust to what seems to be our horrifying new climate environment and in doing so try to provide help to people who are suffering the worst from it i do think we're, we're in the midst of a rise of reactionary attitudes that is not peaked um and I'm, I'm very worried about the republican party as a sort of continuing white nationalist death spiral that um our, our political system is not able to excise and so could just continue to drag our country down for the foreseeable future so i think that's i think there's good reason to be very nervous and and like um you know, especially worried about the way that anti-woke reactionaries are feeding a conspiracy riddled right wing environment. Well, I do um, agree with that, especially seeing the recent sort of anti-vaccine development from the IDW and all of these things. So mm -hmm. I think that, uh, you know, there is reason to be worried about the future and I'm generally pessimistic, but I also uh, agree with Pinker in that the future generally speaking on average gets better and is often uh, the slide of progress is upward so i i don't I, I don't think i don't think pinker actually proves that at all <laughs> i think some th i think best we can say some things get better and some things stay bad and some things get worse yeah well we could discuss that sometime later on uh mm -hmm. right so i'll put the link to your podcast which i'm a huge fan of your podcast i think i told you that so oh, thanks. almost regularly yeah. watch it so it's one of the best philosophy podcasts so i'll put the link in the description below people can follow you on twitter etv pod is that uh your right at etv at etv pod again and there's actually the two podcasts there's embrace the void and philosophers in space so for people who prefer one one style more than the other they're very different shows yep you can follow that and uh like comment subscribe uh and let me know if you have any guest recommendations so uh, with that we're done all right thanks very much